All right, folks. How about now? Better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so people are, uh, for people who are watching the recording, I'm sorry, but uh, I forgot the mic, so we just have this mic here. So I'll have to try to reiterate your questions. Uh, talk loud if you need to talk. Um, and let's, uh, announcements. Oh, midterm on the 5th. All saw the Piazza post. It's on the website. In this room, on the 5th, same time, no notes, no nothing. You'll do well. I, I have faith. I can't promise you'll do well, but you can do well. All right. OK. So let's then step back a little bit and refresh ourselves. We're finishing up our last little bit of crypto here. So what is the key problem that we've seen in public key cryptography? Yeah, okay, so why? Why are they susceptible to man in the middle attacks? Because the man in the middle has access to the key that wants public keys. Uh, okay, so the man in the middle has access to their public keys all the time? I mean, when does that actually, when is it actually a problem? Because we, when we talked about the security of public key crypto systems, right, we assumed that everyone knew everyone's public key, right? Eve knew everyone's public key, but that didn't enable her to launching attacks. Yeah. So the challenge is sharing your key with other people because an attacker could replace your key with their own and then they can encrypt everything. Yeah, so then the key, the, the problem here is that the, um, how do we exchange public keys and how do I know that your public key is actually, and you are who you say you are when you're giving me your public key? So how to do that uh, type of mechanism. So we talked about and we derived actually one kind of mechanism for this, the public key infrastructure. What was that about? Yeah, certificate authority. So we kind of delegate trust to some other authorities who can sign and create certificates for other people. Then they can have a complex chain of hierarchy of people. We can decide which certificate authorities we're willing to trust based on what we want to have happen. Um, so yeah, we can create this nice kind of uh, more centralized structure of, and essentially delegating that key verification process to somebody else. So there's some other, um, in this case, a certificate authority, but it's somebody else that we're delegating and saying like, okay, they'll figure out who's who. But what if we can't do that? So what if you're, what if you don't trust these companies? What if you um, don't, uh, you, uh, let's say you're an activist and you have reason to distrust your government or any other certificate authorities, um, but then how do you actually use public key cryptography in a safe or potentially safe way. Yeah. Yeah, so we can maybe, okay, we can think about de decentralized, right? So the key problem there is there's a central entity that maybe we don't trust, right? So then we can decentralize it. And so what would, would this actually look like? my cursor okay what the hell is going on can you see my cursor no me neither okay so don't also don't have the the thing so things gonna get even worse and what is going on now okay no nope. There we go. Wow, that was weird. Uh, okay, cool. Okay, so we don't have a central entity that we can trust, so let's talk about our situation, right? So we have, um, and I'm gonna try to draw as little as possible. It's not going well, this is with my finger. Okay, so we have Alice and Bob, right? They have their public keys, right? Public key of Bob. 
public key of Alice. So then what would this decentralized model look like? Or what maybe do we, can we think of what types of ways could it or should it operate? How do they get that list? So yeah, let's think about that. So we have to bootstrap this process somehow, right? So okay, Alice and Bob, let's say they know each other, right, in person. So then how could they verify each other's identity? And, and so if we think about decentralizing a certificate authority, right, what was special about a certificate authority where they could sign and create signatures and certificates for other people's public keys? What was special about them? Yeah, that was the only special thing is we decided to trust them, right? Other than that, there's nothing special. They were just another entity with a public key and a private key, right? So Alice or Bob could make a certificate for the other one, right? That says, I'm Alice and I trust that this is Bob and I verify that this is Bob. How can, um, how can they actually do this? So how can Alice and Bob maybe verify each other's identity? In where? In person. In person, yeah. So they have to meet in person, right? They have to either share their fingerprint of their key or something or a hash of their key with each other so that they know what the other person's key looks like. Um, they probably need to verify them uh, maybe by an identification card maybe to verify they're actually their real identity, right? Um, Okay, so if they can do that, then let's say Alice and Bob have verified each other. Now we have, uh, we'll call Charlie. Uh, Charlie comes into the picture. Now, how can Alice try to convince Charlie that she is who she says she is? No, no, back behind you. Sorry. Yeah, so maybe what if uh, Bob and Charlie know each other, right? They've actually verified each other, met in person, but Alice and Charlie have never met. So when Alice and Bob meet, right, just like before, we could say that there's a... I don't want to write this all out. Well, you see for cert. So Alice has a certificate from Bob on the public key of Alice, right? So we saw this last time. This is a cryptographic proof that she can give to anyone and said that Bob knows that I am, Bob agrees I am who I say I am, right, with this certificate. And so with this, Bob then has the private key of Bob, the private key of, Al uh, sorry, public. The public key of Bob, the public key of Alice, and a certificate from Alice about the public key of Bob. Right, and so when Bob and Charlie meet, what does, so Charlie has his public key, and then what does he know when he and Bob verify each other? Bob and Charlie meet? Yeah. So, uh, let's say not yet. Well, or let's say they happen simultaneously, whatever. Let's ignore the public key of Alice for right now. Um, but at least, so Bob and Charlie will meet. So Bob and Charlie will get the public key of Bob, right? And then Charlie will get a certificate from Bob 
that says, hey, Charlie is who he says he is. And similarly, Bob will now get another certificate from Charlie about the public key of Bob. Right, so when Alice and Charlie meet, right, they want to maybe communicate with each other. What can Alice give to Bob to, or sorry, what can Alice give to Charlie to maybe prove through Bob that she is who she says she is? Yeah, the certificate of Bob on her public key, right? Because Charlie can take that, right? So Alice can send this over to uh, Charlie. Charlie can get this. He can see, okay, this is um, a certificate, so I can check it with Bob's public key, which Charlie has. He can check it. He can then hash the public key of Alice, make sure it matches the hash in there, just like that mechanism that we came up with before. And then Charlie, so then what does Charlie know? Charlie doesn't actually know that Alice is who she said she is. What does Charlie actually know? Yeah, that Bob thinks she is who she said she is, right? And so if Charlie trusts Bob, then, well, then he can trust Alice now, right? Because Alice is, Bob is vouched for Alice, and so then Charlie and Alice can now uh, verify essentially each other's identities without ever meeting, just based on their certificates, right? But what if then uh, Charlie knows Daisy and and Daisy knows uh, what's an E name? Eve. Eve. There we go. Wow. Eve was evil. We'll go with Ellen. She's nice. Okay. Ellen. And so, okay. So this is going to be a little bit convoluted, but let's say, so Alice has met Charlie, right? We can say that Alice and Charlie trust each other now. They have each other's, uh, maybe they've signed each other's keys because they trust each other. Now Alice meets Eve, wants to talk to Eve. Should Alice trust Eve? So we're using kind of a bi-directional link here to kind of denote trust. They trust each other. They've signed each other's keys, right? So that you can think of Charlie can have a signature, and we could now, in this case, send all the public keys. And you can say, hey, look, all these people, like I've got my public key signed by uh, Dale, who got it signed by uh, Ellen. And, and maybe um, Alice can prove that to Ellen and show that, hey, Charlie signed mine. So should they trust each other? Yeah, it seems kind of a little bit sketchy, right? I guess I'm So then you have, okay, so if you can think about what we're building here, it's essentially a network or a web, right? Just like the internet, the World Wide Web is a web of links, right? So you can have people here that all verify the identity of other people. But now you get into this important problem of trust. What, how do you trust? So maybe, of course, you trust the people that you manually verified their keys in person. You trust them a lot. But then what about the people they verified? Are they as good as you about trusting and verifying people? And then what about the people that those people trust and then those people trust, right? So here you have kind of, was it two or three degrees of separation here between um, Alice and Eve? And so yeah, so anyways, the, um, so there's a couple interesting things. What do you do if, so we'll think about this for a second. What do you do if uh, Frank, well, I'm really running out of names here. Frank, what if Frank is here? He wants to talk to Alice, and he says, I'm Frank, and here are, I've got 100 certificates on my key, signatures on my key. I've got 100 certificates, but Alice doesn't have any of them in common. So she's not able to address, uh, verify the identity of anyone. Does she trust? 
trust that person. No, because Frank could have made up all those key pairs, right? We don't know that those are from actual different people, right? They could have been made from anything. Um, so yeah, but but it could be that you know we just don't have anybody in our social connections that actually match with each other, right? Maybe those are all legitimate keys, but if we're operating from the assumption of uh, maximal distrust, right? We'd say, yeah, I don't really believe that you're Frank. I'm going to wait until maybe I can uh, communicate with other people. So can you use a system like this for, let's say, websites? Like we talked about, we used the website model last time. Could you? Yes. Would you want to? What would it mean? Yeah, so you'd need, the websites would need a way of kind of cross-verifying each other, which is not exactly clear how they would do that, right? But even if you had, like, I don't know, Microsoft trusting Amazon, or, I don't know, Microsoft and Apple used to be partners. Like, it was a big deal when uh, Office would work on a Mac or whatever, but now they're directly competing in a lot of different areas. Or uh... So yeah, it's not really clear how you do this graph. And then if you're a new website, how do you get integrated into this graph? Like, who's gonna be the one to sign your key and give you a certificate so that you can join this web? Are they gonna pay, are you gonna have to pay for that privilege? Yeah, just not a centralized person, exactly. So that's where you now get the public key infrastructure, right? So uh, the important thing to think about these two different models, right? You have this centralized model with this public key infrastructure, and you have this more decentralized model. It may or may not work depending on different situations. What about if, like we talked about here, these are people, and this is like a way to do encrypted communication between each other? Would something like this be feasible? So how would you do it to design it? Describe the steps and how you do it. Yeah. Okay, so meet a person in person, give them your a printout of your, let's call it the fingerprint of your key, which is like the hash of your key, so that they know it's you and they can Verify that that key has your identity. We can maybe use emails in this case, so we can verify that that key has is associated with your email address, and then they could sign that key, send it back to you. So now you have that as part of your signatures that you can prove to other people. Yeah, but that's one person. Yeah. You can have a two-sided party where everyone goes and brings their ID proof and their key, and everyone verifies everyone else. Yes, this is a real thing. This is not. So it's a, uh, you have this problem a lot also in like uh, open source software that uses uh, key signing for software distribution. Like also how do you do this kind of trust? So you literally get people in a room like this, you bring your identification card and a printout of your uh, fingerprint and you would check everyone and then when you checked everybody you create signatures so you could then have a big network of people so you could actually be more connected through and then maybe you'd need to then, we'd have to, again, worry about the, well, what do you do about trust, right? How does trust propagate? So now you have the problem of, well, how do I, so I know, do I really trust all of you if you're just doing this for an assignment, right? Versus the open source developer that's a crazy, uh, I don't know, Debian contributor that uh, is very, um, well, I don't want to get too close to describing someone. Someone who I know takes key signing very seriously, and it's, you know, do I trust them more than a random maybe person in my class, right? Um, yeah, so you can have mechanisms then maybe to set how different people, what levels of trust they have so that the trust doesn't propagate too far to various people. Um, so what's the downside here? Yeah, you actually have to meet in person, right? So you're at least limited to your local network of people in your immediate vicinity, right? So then you're relying on other people who maybe travel more often 
and who sign more keys with other people in other ge geographies, you're trusting them a lot to be the connector between different groups and different kind of like, uh, social network clusters, let's say. What else? Benefits? What are the benefits? Oh, yeah, please. Uh, one of the weaknesses is if even one of these people, if you hacked or something, they could, hacker could start signing a bunch of keys that are completely fake. Right, so yeah, attacker could start pretending, and if you're a trusted entity, right, people will trust your vouching for other people and your signatures. Yeah, also what happens, well, let's go to that scenario. So what happens if you break into one of these people? What if Bob's uh, secret key is stolen because he accidentally, uh, this actually happens more often than you think. Instead of sending you his public key, he sends you his private key. Um, so Bob sends you this, and then um, this even happens when we run, uh, when we used to run uh, capture the flag events where all the teams had to uh, basically VPN into us. So they needed to create keys, and they had to send us the public key so we could add it to our system. And out of like you know, 30 teams, at least two or three would send you their private key as well. This is not how this is supposed to work. Uh, but then it was actually very helpful for debugging later because I got to connect as them because I had their key. Um, but yeah, okay, so then, then the question is, so Bob's uh, private key gets stolen, what happens? Yeah? You want to stop trusting any news that Bob is you, but how does he know when it got stolen? Yeah, you kind of want to invalidate all of Bob's signatures, right? But then how do you do that in this graph? Because just because you've signed somebody's key doesn't mean you actually have a way to communicate with them all the time, right? Well, I guess if you're using emails, you could just go through this whole graph and figure out everyone's emails and just send out a nice, polite email to everyone being like, oh, Bob's key, revoke trust in Bob's key. Right, but that's kind of actually a crazy thing to do and to actually try to implement and email a bunch of people like that is so you need some mechanism, again, similar to the certificate authority model. You need some kind of mechanism for key revocation, right, of like, so you need maybe a, now you think, okay, well now there has to be a centralized service where I can revoke a key and maybe people check if a key's been revoked or not. Yeah? Say it again, louder. Yeah, so you could do it basically when people talk, they could kind of pass a revocation list along. The problem is with the revocation list, it can never shrink because we never want Bob's key to ever be used in the future again, right? So Bob's key has to be on this list forever that it's been revoked. And if you think about over time, the number of revocations just keeps growing and growing and growing. You can't really throw it away. So yeah, it's a tricky, uh, there's no, I think, easy or good answers. There's all various kind of ad hoc solutions that you know, try to address this, but it's a fundamentally difficult problem here. I mean, this is like, this actually, to be perfectly honest, the best reason of switching to Gradescope than my own server is I didn't have a password reset set up. So whenever a student would lose their password, they'd have to email me and I'd have to go fix it. Um, so you, you, know, you hope people remember their passwords. They, of course, don't, which I understand. Um, so yeah, this is essentially the same thing. If you lose access to your key or you accidentally, uh, whatever, just want to revoke your key, um, it makes it a huge pain to deal with this in this system. Cool. Any other thoughts on this? All right. The And the great thing here is here you're kind of putting trust into users and not the system itself, right? So before with certificate authorities, we talked about how now we have this central entity that has all this trust. Well, now every end user essentially gets to decide who they trust, right? And why and how much trust to put in somebody. Um, the difficult thing is propagating that trust throughout the graph and figuring all that out. Um,
So PGP is probably the most uh, well-known open source implementation of this of public key cryptography. So with, uh, I think it stands for pretty good privacy, or maybe that's a backronym or something. Um, but it is an, is it PGP and GPG? Yeah, yeah, okay, so PGP I think is the company and GPG is the open source software that's compatible. Um, and I don't know, what, I can't remember what GPG stands for, if anybody remembers. Is it GNU Public something? What? GNU Privacy Guard. Ah, there we go. GNU Privacy Guard. Um, cool. So the basic idea is this is software that allows you to create a public key and a private key, and then allows you to do things like all the operations that we talked about of actually encrypting a message um, with somebody else's public key, or creating a signature on a message so that everyone knows that a message only came from you. Um, you can do things. You can also do, and it has this whole web of trust model that we just talked about. So you can have other people sign your key so they've verified that you are who you say you are. And then you can, as your public key you send to other people, you've now accumulated more and more signatures. So you have more and more people that vouch for you and that you are who you say you are. Um, it's a pretty cool system. We'll get into it more in a future homework assignment. Cool. Okay. Awesome. And so kind of uh, wrapping up crypto, so we've only really scratched the surface here. So we've, the goal here was to have you kind of understand what are these primitives that we can use to get things like uh, confidentiality and integrity, and specifically how, in what mechanisms do they work? Why do they work? What are some of the pros and cons? Um, there's all kinds of crazy things with breaking cryptography. So if you're interested in breaking crypto, there's insane math that is done to break cryptography. So uh, like we talked about taking a um, hash collision attack from a brute force of two to the 128 to two to the 127 is a huge breakthrough there. And attacks uh, get better over time. Uh, very interesting thing that I read recently when looking up. So the Visionaire cipher, I think I forgot to mention, it was, I think, created in about the 1500s, and it was considered to be perfect, like unbreakable. And now you're breaking it as a homework assignment. Um, because, and the, the method of identifying repetitions in order to identify key length, that was created in, I believe, the 1800s. And so that's what led to the first breaking of this uh, cipher. So, um, you know, all kinds of like theoretical concepts of how to break it based on how the algorithm works. When we looked at, the, you know, the insane um, DES system, right? How it worked with the different S boxes and permutations and substitutions. Like, you know, people are able to find flaws in that, which is insanely cool. The other cool thing is breaking implementations. And this is, I think, happens much more often of people um, using the wrong key for something or, uh, um, what are some common implementations? Um, Oh, so there's a really cool attack that involves uh, padding. So we kind of ignored this problem of every time you encrypt something in a symmetric crypto system, it has to be a size of the block size, right? And we looked at ECB, just like splitting up the input into different blocks. We looked at CBC of chaining those blocks. Uh, the problem is what happens if your data does not end in an actual op uh, offset of your block size? Right? You need to add some data there, but you need to know that that is data that's been added there and not removed. Anyways, long story short, if you um, are able to, if a crypto system tells you that the padding was incorrect or correct, you can actually use that data to break and derive the key. Um, it is actually super crazy and a really cool attack, but it's based on an implementation flaw of getting this kind of additional information. Uh, if this kind of thing excites you and you're really stoked about this, the best advice I have is to go to this uh, website. It's called CryptoPals.com. They have a series of different like challenges where essentially you build the crypto system and then break it in kind of the same challenges. So it'd be like uh, build an ECB crypto system that, and actually some of the first things are doing Visionaire and other types of things. Um, but then it, you do this uh, CBC padding Oracle attack <coughs> kind of read how it works, but then actually implementing it. Um, I've worked my way through some of this, not, uh, not super far, but it is insanely fun if you're really into this stuff. 
Yeah. Just for my own curiosity, mm -hmm. um, the Keeper Cipher, the Missionary, is there like something after that, like the step up that's like known to play with? Yes. I think the best thing there would probably be the crypto systems that were done in like World War II era. When, we got, when I say like the Enigma machines and early types of um, crypto systems like that, I think they're uh, just essentially more complicated versions of permutations and shifts and, and uh, so yeah, that's kind of where I'd look there uh, historically. I think probably after that point is out of the realm of essentially doing it by hand and they needed machines to do it. Cool. So the other way that you can kind of do research in cryptography is essentially securing crypto and that can involve, um, you know, creating new theory, new implementations. So coming up with brand new models of doing cryptography finding different so the other really interesting thing have you either thought at all about or talked about uh, quantum computers <laughs> right so what was the basis of security for rsa that it's hard to factor large composite numbers yeah that it's easy to multiply two numbers together but it's very difficult to find the factors of a large number but it's not, let's say, necessarily proven that it is difficult. And with quantum computers, um, there are algorithms that they can run to factor a um, number in uh, less time than it would take a normal computer. Anyway, so then there's, so knowing that there are future cryptography that's been developed that actually is quantum proof. So even if there are quantum computers, they still can't uh, do the difficult operation in an easy amount of time. And there's all types of areas of super cool types of cryptography. Uh, one of the super interesting things is homomorphic encryption. So this is like a, um, so how many people use Gmail for their email? Yeah, most everyone. Okay, do you think it's cool that Google now has a copy of every email and communication you send? Pretty cool. What's that again? Yeah. Expected, right? Why, why is it nice? It is nice, for sure. But why? If you lose your password, you can still read your old emails? Yeah, if you lose your password, you can read your emails. They provide search capabilities, which is super nice, right? You like to be able to search through emails. Um, you could, and there are um, systems where you can have, based on public private key, you upload your public key, and they encrypt all of your emails with your public key. So you're the only person that can read them. You have to download them locally, use your private key to decrypt it. Uh, but that has a lot of problems, particularly with something like email. Like I, I don't want to store all my emails on my local system. Um, I want to, be, and I want to be able to use Google's resources to search my email. So homomorphic encryption is a super cool idea where you can actually, Google can encrypt your emails in such a way that they can't know what the contents are but they can do operations on them like search. So they could identify all the emails that match a specific search term and send those encrypted emails to you. So the only thing they learn is that that, e that search term is in there. They send them to you, you decrypt it, and then you have the full contents of the email. Um, yeah? Mm. So this is, there's two different ways. So one is uh, emails in transit. So if I send you an email, what? what happens to our email along the way. And the other option is when you get an email, is it encrypted so that your um, email provider can't read it? Or if your email provider is subpoenaed by the US government, they can say, well, here, here it is. It's just an encrypted blob. I have no idea what's in here. Um, yeah, so two different kind of areas there. Um, other kind of crazy or insane uh, cryptography operations uh, secure multi-party computation. This is essentially the idea, um, oh, maybe it's a relevant example. So if the, uh, let's see, if, uh, let's say ASU and U of A want to calculate some, what would be an important thing for a university to maybe know across, let's say the state of Arizona. So like we want to calculate some kind of value about our students, like statistics or something, what would be useful? 
Income, that's a good one. Yeah, so we want to calculate what's the average income of a student at ASU and University of Arizona. But ASU, we don't trust U of A. We're not going to give them access to our data, right? And we don't actually trust them either, so they, or they don't trust us, so they don't want to give us access to their data. So how can we run this calculation across both our data sets so that we know that um, we can actually cryptographically verify the result and the only thing they learn about it is the outcome. Nobody learns about each other's data. Uh, other things that you can think about are healthcare. So you have two different maybe insurance companies that are actually competitors and don't want to give each other access to their data, but they want to run rates of like how many people get cancer in a certain area or something. And the more data you have, the better that can actually be. Um, and you can do secure multi-party computation to do this. It's really, really cool. And there's a whole host of other areas that I, we didn't even touch on, but there's a lot of other areas. Um, also kind of applied cryptography, so how do you take these ideas and use them in new, different, interesting ways? Um, kind of using the primitives that we've talked about here, how can you shape them and create something new? So for instance, like, uh, anybody use uh, Signal? Yeah, or WhatsApp? Facebook Messenger? Know, how many hands am I gonna see up? Does nobody use any kind of app to talk to anyone? <laughs> Instagram DMs? Like how far do I have to get? <laughs> okay, yeah, those are definitely not encrypted. Uh, even, so at least uh, WhatsApp, even though it's owned by Facebook, is end-to-end -end encrypted so that, um, that uh, not even WhatsApp should be able to read your messages. There is a little bit of weirdness there that I'm not quite 100% aware of. But um, at least I know Signal is probably the best option now for actual secure end-to-end -end communication where they can't, cannot read your messages or anything. So uh, if you want to have secure communication, probably actually the best way that, that turn this into real things is, um, is uh, Signal. Cool, questions, crypto? Yes, and I believe they have ways to deal with that by kind of inserting fake responses uh, because it doesn't really matter because once you get the data and you can decrypt it, you know which ones are and are not. So you can add noise into there so you can fool those types of systems. Uh, but yeah, definitely that's, I know that's a concern and they definitely have ways to deal with it. Yeah, questions? All right, making real good progress. I'm very happy. And now, and now my mouse cursor disappears. How does this happen? All right, maybe it's PowerPoint. Okay, so now <clears throat> we're gonna go right into authentication. So now we've actually learned enough about cryptography to understand how those primitives work so we can understand how to actually authenticate people. Um, so first, What is authorization? We've already talked about this, so what's auth authorization? Exactly, so access. So authorization, right, is what can you do on this page? What were some uh, like access control models? So access control is a part of authorization. What were some access control models? Like role based, yeah. maybe uh, role based access control. What else? Yeah. Like yeah, so permission lists or, um, yeah, permission lists, access control lists, discretionary access control, mandatory access control, right? All different types of models of thinking about who can access what. But we still didn't answer an important question there, right? So, what is authentication? compared to authorization. Yeah. Same, like, 
Yeah, we talked a lot about how do we decide who can do what, but we didn't talk about how do we decide who is who, right? When you go to a computer system, how does it know that you are who you say they are? Right, so authentic, you can think of, I think of it like this, authentication is who are you, and authorization is what can you do. So we've kind of come at this in the reverse order of what you can do, and then uh, who are you. But I think it's important, so we can talk about that first, and crypto, and then this. So how do we do authentication in the real world? Like, how do you know I am who I say I am? Have you ever checked my ID? Yeah, but how, how did that get updated? I'm assuming HR did their job right. Well, I'm sure it's quite an assumption in the trust. But how do they know? I just show up and... Maybe I, or maybe the real Adam actually did that, right? Signed up, and then I broke into his computer, uploaded a new picture to ASU, and registered a domain name with his name, and then uploaded my picture there, and then just showed up and taught, and nobody else showed up and taught. <laughs> so you all just assume I am who I say I am, yeah. I seem credible? Oh. <laughs> We haven't actually done that yet, I don't think. Maybe when you start studying for the midterm, you'll realize I just made stuff up. Yeah. If you're uh, good enough to pull this off in your already credible class. Ah, interesting. So maybe it doesn't matter. So it's kind of like the uh, Python like duck, ty duck typing argument versus uh, static typing. Right? It's like, I don't really care what object you are as long as you do what you say you can do, right? So as long as you teach the class fine, we actually don't care who you are. <laughs> Interesting. What was that? Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of, you should watch the movie Catch Me If You Can. I think that's another interesting one uh, where this identity problem comes up, right? Of how do you know who actually is who? And, um, it depends on one thing. If like, ah, maybe I'm teaching a class and I can maybe BS my way through it or whatever, but if I'm flying a plane or something, you'd probably want to make sure I am who I say I am, right? So, okay, beyond what you, your massive authentication failure in this class, um, how could you authenticate me? And it's actually tied into what we talked about with uh, Web of Trust, right? How you authenticate. Yeah, so maybe you can look at multiple, and this is kind of what you've talked about, like, right, multiple pieces of information. You look at the website, you look at my website, but then you realize I control that. So maybe you look at ASU's website. Um, you can maybe think even through, um, so the other thing to think about is, nobody mentioned this, the undergrad TAs, right? We're all, uh, took this class last semester. So if like a different person showed up to teach this semester with the same name, that would probably be a little weird. So at least you know the scam went back farther than one semester. Um, you can maybe contact other people. So first we need to kind of define what we mean and what are we talking about with uh, authentication. So yeah, okay, cool. Perfect, okay, so you basically have, you are a principal and not the principal of a school, like a, you are a, a unique entity Right, so, and this is tied to your identity, which is slightly different in this context. So essentially the way to think of it is, um, and you can see this in various websites. So you are you, right? If you think about it in terms of identity, right? But how does a computer system know, represent you and your identity? They don't say, well, he's uh, I don't know, 5'10 and has brown hair, and that's how they authenticate people, right? Like, how does the computer system, what does the computer system think of your identity? Or for instance, when you log into my ASU. Yeah, your username and password. So your username is associated with a bunch of information, probably one of which is your unique identifier that uniquely identifies you. 
right? Usually that's an I, uh, usually it's an integer because that's a lot easier for computers to deal with. So you'll be some unique identity. So and essentially we want authentication is this process of binding and and the other notion we want to come up with here is a subject. So this is something that acts on behalf of an entity, right? So you're a principal, you're not, you're a person, right? You're using, when you log on to my ASU, you're not actually logging on to my ASU. You're using a web browser that is logging on, talking HTTP protocol to myasu.com, .edu. Um, that's talking to the web server, so in some sense, there's no way, they don't, they don't actually know they're talking to you, a real person. It could be a robot, it could be somebody pretending to be you, your friend at the keyboard, whatever, right? But this idea is how do we then bind an identity and how do we specify that, okay, you are this person? So we've talked about some notions, so what are some other ways? So somebody mentioned username passwords. Why is that an authentication mechanism? What is that actually checking? Is it actually verifying your identity? Yeah. But why only me? Potentially, yes. Okay, so yeah, that's that's the key, right? So it's when you created this account or on this system, right? You came up with a unique password that is known only to you. So that means in future visits to this system, you can authenticate with it by giving that information that you only gave a long time. That still doesn't actually guarantee that you are who you say they are, right? You can create, a, you can go create a Twitter account as anybody or whatever, pretending to be them, right? So still the notion of identity is a little bit difficult there, but at least with username and password, we can say that, okay, you are the person who originally created this account, let's say. Okay, username and passwords are one, what else do you actually use? Yeah, what's over here, yeah. Yeah, so biometrics. So does anybody actually use that on their devices? What do you actually use? Uh, face recognition? Fingerprint? Both? Um, iris scan, does anybody use that? So what's that trying to authenticate you based on? How do you know? Have you the checked everyone's face or fingerprint? Yeah, so when you set up or created this, this thing, so you're uh, binding a physical attribute of yourself to the system, right, and using that to talk to the system. Or your face, facial recognition. Um, okay, so that's one. What else? Or another one? What else? Yeah. So what does that mean? Yeah, okay, so let's think about um, a text message, right? So you get a, you sign onto a website, it has a username and password, it says, hey, I wanna really check that this is you. Uh, I just sent you a text message to the phone number that you have. Uh, type in that code here so I can verify that. So what are they actually trying to authenticate there? That you know the password and you have a phone. That you know the password and that you you have a phone capable of, your device capable of receiving that text message. Oh, okay. Uh, because there's actually been a lot of attacks recently against uh, the phone text message based authentication. Um, okay, so what else? Smart card. Smart card, yeah, does anybody use that for work? Yeah, so you have a smart card, you have to plug into your computer. So the way that works, there's some key on there that they're using to validate that uh, you are who you say they are, you are. Yeah, what else? Back there. Uh, what is the device you usually logged in from? Ah, the device that you usually logged in from, right? Um, has anybody gone on a trip and tried to log into their Gmail? Do you get a scary warning message that says, uh, hey, you're logging in from uh, the Philippines and you usually log in in Tempe, Arizona, um, right? Telling you that it may be suspicious. It usually probably won't block your access, but it'll at least alert you that maybe something as weird is going on if that's not you, right? <coughs> cool, anything else? Yeah. IP address and address? Yeah, so, ooh, well, okay, so IP address for sure. 
Uh, yeah, I guess on a local network, a MAC address can be used to authenticate you, although we'll see when we get to networking. Both of them can be spoofed. So we'll talk about it in networking, but a remote service doesn't get your MAC address, only on your local network. Uh, but if it's an app running, they could use that. So they could use that as a feature to fingerprint you. Yeah. Are you using a YubiKey? Uh, YubiKey, yeah. So a little, uh, does anybody have one? Show up. Can you show it to the class? A little show and tell. Oh, there we go. Over there, oh, multiple people, great. So yeah, a little USB key that you plug in that, again, as like a security, it probably has a um, private key that's only on that device, and so it's able to authenticate that you have this physical device, because it's the only device that has that key. Um, what about you ever um, go to like, get a new computer or something, and go to Amazon or PayPal or something, and it says, hey, I don't recognize this device? What is it checking there? Uh, cookies are part of it. Yeah, it's actually more. Yeah, and so they need to try to do another layer of authentication because they're worried that it's somebody else that's stolen your username and password. So they actually fingerprint your browser to try to determine what does this browser look like and is this the same browser that I see over and over accessing your account. Cool. All right. These were good examples. So we can kind of, and the way I think about these, we break these down into different categories. And this kind of helps when thinking about authentication, right? So one category could be what you know, so something that you know. So a classic example is username and passwords, right? That's something that you know because you set up username and passwords in the past, and it should be something that you're the only person that knows that. What's another example of something that you know? Security questions, right? Is it true that you're, yeah, what are some, what are some security questions you've heard? Yeah, what's it? Uh, mother's maiden name, mother's maiden pet. Mother's maiden name, name of your first pet, what else? Where, what city were you born in? Favorite movie. Favorite movie. Yeah, so it's starting to sound like somebody's social networking page. <laughs> right, and this is actually one of the big problems with security questions, is off, too often people, it's very easy to find out this information the name of your first pet, all this kind of stuff. But, what was it? You, you can lie, yeah, but you have to remember which lies you made to which systems. <laughs> I've heard of a case where somebody, uh, for their security question, just randomly typed in letters, and so when they would have to call in to be like, hey, there's a problem with my account, they're like, great, answer the security question, and you just have to say a bunch of gibberish, like, I don't know what the letters are. <laughs> Hoping that they could actually see it, if not, then you'd be kind of uh, not really good. Okay, what are the things that you know? Anybody uh, apply for a loan? What kind of questions uh, get asked there? Credit score, what else? Yeah, where have you taken out loans before? They also, yeah. Past addresses, yeah, this is a, a super interesting thing. So they ask you what are other, they give you like, it's like a multiple choice test that they say, hey, which of these four addresses have you lived in in the past? And it's like three addresses and none of the above. And you have to answer several of those. Um, personally, the only way, way I can answer those is looking at Amazon, all my Amazon <laughs> addresses. Yeah. I learned through that that my bank put down uh, one of my past employers, like they spelled it wrong, because <laughs> they wanted me to spell it and I couldn't get it right. <laughs> <laughs> wow, interesting. Yeah, so there's problems there. But this is kind of an interesting example of something that you know that you never explicitly told somebody or that you didn't tell them in the context of authentication, right? This is information that they're mining from public data and public information and all kinds of data sources to create questions that only you should be able to answer. Cool. Uh, so then the other, okay, so yeah, the, other aspects here are like what you possess. So this is something uh, that like we talked about the text message to the device, right? You possess that phone that is capable of answering that text message or the phone call, right? Yeah. Um, so about like, so it says you can like possess security issues like using the text. Is mm -hmm. that why you see like more authenticator apps that way to like prevent against 
Yeah, so the text messages, it's called the uh, sim jacking or sim swapping, where essentially what they'll do is, uh, there's uh, multiple ways to do it. One of the easiest ways is you just um, go into a Verizon or AT&T store and you either trick or bribe the employee to make you a SIM card that has that phone number on it. And then you try to log into the site and right before you do, you plug in the SIM card so that you're now the owner of that phone number. And then you sign in, get the text message, unplug the SIM so they never really know that happened and now you stole that uh, authentication token. Um, yeah, it's really funny. I've, Talked to various people and apparently the phone companies are very upset that the technology companies decided to just use the phone network for this <coughs> important piece of authentication that was never designed to do. Um, and yeah, so that's why now more often, uh, like on Gmail, you have, uh, and actually, no, it was, I think three years ago, somebody in my class in 365 said that they had their Coinbase account hacked into by a SIM swapping attack. Um, other ways of perpetuating the attack are you um, bribe an employee at the companies, at like AT&T or whatever, to install software, essentially malware on their system that allows the bad guys remotely to get text messages and other, and like create SIM cards for various things so you don't even need to go into a place. Uh, yeah. How does the Benchcom phone service work on location? How does what? Um, I don't know all the details. I know it's possible to, um, one of the things they do is they can like uh, trick you to connect to a cell tower so you can make a uh, system that pretends to be a cell phone tower. You can get phones to connect to you and you can tell them to not use any encryption or anything. And so when they talk to you, uh, all the text message, all the phone calls are unencrypted, so I know that's one way they can tap into your phone network, uh, your cell phone, that way. I don't know about cloning, I'm not, I don't know how that, that works. But yeah, there's all kinds of cool stuff, yeah. Uh, so, how do, so like, I know so like now, like with Google, so like if I put in my password for something, like, or like with the two-step verification, mm -hmm. it's not like a text message, but it's like something like Yes, up. okay, yeah. Cool, yeah, so let's, uh, this is a part of the what you possess. So it's similar to a YubiKey or anything. It's, um, see, I can show you because, so this is my uh, Google Authenticator. I have Google, Dropbox, and GitHub things on there. So it's a six digit number that changes every minute, I believe. And the whole idea is, the way this is set up is you have, um, a, like a QR code that's shown on the computer screen and then you point the app at the QR code and essentially what happens is now you've shared a secret key between both sides and then what happens is based on that secret key you can generate the same random number at a certain point in time and it's done cryptographically we didn't talk about that type of crypto um, but basically uh, the idea is that's why I can show you that key because if you had those six digits you can't predict what the next one's going to be unless you have the secret so the secret lives in the app, and so um, they know that if you have this phone, you have this app, and so that you're secure um, in that way. So yeah, rather than sending you a text messages, or the other way that Google does it is if you install the Gmail app, Gmail will pop up a thing saying, hey, it looks like you're trying to sign in, is that okay? Like, approve it here, and then you can approve it through the app there. So yes, those are much better than using a text message, but a text message is much better than not using any second factor. So we'll talk about that later in a bit. Yeah. Oh, I was going to get to it later. Yeah. Um, so these are all different things of what you possess, right? You possess this UB key that has a key burned into it. You possess an authenticator app. You possess a phone number that can do this. Um, then the third category is who you are, right? So this is where we get into biometrics. Right? So we talked about face, we talked about um, fingerprint, uh, iris scan would be another one. And you can think about other ones. These are kind of the three main ones that you should definitely burn into your brain because they come up over and over again. Um, other things that we talked about with context of like where are you or what's the context like of what's going on, right? That could be with the Gmail of where are you logging into your Gmail from, what IP address, what country is that IP address likely located in, all that stuff. 
So forgetting the fourth one for a bit, because I want to focus on these three, uh, what are some of the pros and cons of each of these? So like, what's the benefit of what you know? In theory, you should be the only one that knows it. Is that true usually? Who else may know that your, let's say, password, the thing that you know? Yeah, the person that looks on your desk at a sticky note where you've written it, what else? You may not know it because you've forgotten it, right? And so you need some other way of getting access to your account. Yes, this happens constantly. Uh, your password, your, you may use a browser password manager, now your browser knows your password, it may be a third party password manager app that knows your password, what else, yeah? The website just about decided they don't need to have their password. Yeah, so uh, another way to think about that is every website where you reuse the, that password also knows your password, right? Hashing or no hashing, when you log into that website, you have to send them your password, and they now know your password, so you would have to say, well, now I'm using unique passwords on every website I ever visit and every app I ever use. So then you have this problem of how do I remember 200 passwords? Right. So yeah, you have this, so you have interesting problems here of what you know. Forgetting, I think, is a huge one in terms of usability. And then if you know people are gonna forget, this means you need to have another mechanism to get access to your account. So what happens when you forget a password on a website? How do you still authenticate? Because you. You now have to be able to authenticate. How do you do that? Yeah, they essentially prove that you own the email address associated with that account, right? So they'll send an email to your account, you click on that link, it has a randomly generated uh, number there, and the website verifies that yes, this is the same number, and so now it gives you access and the ability to change your password. So if you're an attacker, if you can't break the authentication on the username password, you could try to break the forgotten password method. And if you can do that, you can get into people's accounts, right? Any other downsides? What about pros? What about good things? Yeah. One pro or con, depending on how you look at it, <laughs> is that for what you know, other people can know it. Like maybe for your router at home, you want to know the password and you want your family to know the password. Mm. Find yeah, that's, or, uh, well, maybe a better, more realistic example would be like a Netflix password, yeah. right? Netflix would very much like that you're the only person that knows this password, right? But then they have the ability for you to have different profiles, so clearly they know that other people are gonna be using this account, right? Uh, so yeah, so you have this ability, like, it's kind of nice, just like actually like a key, right? You can make copies of a key and give it to people that you want to so that they can get access to things. Um, but then it becomes more difficult, well, yeah, it becomes difficult to maybe share selectively or something like that, because then they could share that on with other people. Yeah, so sharing is interesting. What are some other pros? I mean, there must be pros. We use it everywhere, right? Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to carry anything with you, right? Everything should be in your brain. What else? Yeah. It's pretty easy to set up. Like, a lot easier to set up than even biometrics yeah a lot easier to yeah easier to set up I think that's definitely true what about changing is being able to change your password a good thing yeah just like we talked about with key revocation right you want to change your password so that other people you know can't guess it um, okay so then same analysis what you possess Pros and cons of things that you possess. Yeah. Um, well, like what you possess, like you could just authenticate against bots or stolen. Yeah. If that's your only way of authentication, right? That Yubi key. Well, you think of lost, stolen, and then the worst part would be whoever stole that thing could impersonate you, yeah. right? So sorry for. I'm sure the Yubi keys that are used here are not used for anything super important. So don't target these nice people that shared their UV keys with us, right? But if that was, if there was a billion dollars to whoever possessed this UV key, you would have a huge target, right? Because now you possess this device, whoever possesses it now has access. Yeah. Can I ask the pro of like you target that specific device instead of like sending a phishing email? 
Yeah, okay, so that's a great, great point. So yeah, so now you need to target this specific device, right, which all of us can do, but let's say, how are we compared to all of the people on the internet, right? So attackers on the internet could be, you know, can scan millions of websites uh, in a day. Anyways, so yeah, the, the level there is kind of interesting, right, because now you're requiring this steal something physically in person, which restricts the attacker's capabilities and who's able to do that. Whereas it's just a, uh, to steal your username and password, I can just trick you to install some malware on your computer that tracks your uh, keystroke. Yeah? So you can give something physical to somebody temporarily, but you can't really give it a password? Interesting, yes, which uh, revokes your access to that thing, right? Which is, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, so you can give it to somebody else to use for a while and then they can give it back. Yeah? Um, if someone were to have like the password to my phone mm -hmm. or even my first and my pay code unlocked it, they can unlock my phone and my laptop too. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the possession. So yeah, so then uh, access to that device now gives you access to whatever the thing is authenticating to, right? So yeah, now you have. So you have problems of theft and loss, uh, which you don't really have with passwords. I mean, you can, theft, yes, but um, you can't like, you can forget a password, but if you forget a password, it's not like that means somebody else can find it and use it later, right? Yeah. You can leave something like a username uh, in a will. Oh, interesting, okay. So yeah, because it's an item, you could use it in a will uh, as, and actually give it to other people. It is not protected by the Fifth Amendment. Ooh, interesting. Um, Self-incriminating search? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd have to think more about that. I don't know where, I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> I don't know all the details there, but I, yeah, that's interesting, yeah. There is the supply chain attack of like a malicious actor could start selling a bunch of low cost Yeah, great. So how do you YubiKey people know that your YubiKey is actually safe and that the YubiKey Corporation, I can't remember who makes them, uh, didn't just actually steal your private key, right? Or have a backdoor that every time you connect it to your USB drive, it actually sends your key back to them. Just in case anybody's using it for a billion dollar operation, they can steal that, right? Um, yeah, so like the way you possess is interesting because now you're trusting this device, you're trusting the manufacturer of the device, the whole supply chain. Yeah, awesome. What about uh, what you are? What are some pros and cons? Yeah. What if you have a twin? Yeah, so maybe the, let's, maybe another way to put that is, so one of the things we would hope is that features like our uh, fingerprints and face are actually unique, but in a case of maybe you have a twin or a sibling that looks very much like you, maybe your face actually looks like theirs and they could unlock your device. Has that, has that ever happened to anybody? I have to look that up. I heard that it happened. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, yeah. It requires extra hardware. It requires extra hardware, so it can be expensive to develop these kind of authentication mechanisms. Yeah. I wonder if you could just scan their face or finger while they're sleeping, like saying. And then do what? <laughs> Well, they need to actually maybe make a fake finger with your finger, right? So that's the, um, but yeah, so yeah, let's, let's keep going. There's been problems with face scanning that like can tell people certain races apart because partly the idea is because of the diversity of the team that develops it and to model it. Yeah, so you'd have to deal with training of models that may have biases in them to based on the team that developed them or input data, yeah. Yeah, so we talked about the passwords, right? It's very easy to change passwords. Uh, is it easy to change your fingerprints? I mean, you got about 10 choices, right? So it's about 10 times you could change it. And then at some point, like, yeah, you're out of fingerprints, yeah. You could lose a collection. You could lose, so if you knew that this thumb uh, protected a billion dollar account, right? Yeah. Yeah, 
it takes would be like bolt cutters or something. You cut off a thumb, and I lose a thumb, and you get a billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah, or you borrow somebody's phone or anything, right? Yeah. Um, my mom has an internship like Warren Off, so that every time she applies for a passport, they're like uh, It's like a black hospital. thing? Oh, that's super interesting. Uh, yeah, I haven't heard about that, but at least reminds me of the movie like Men in Black, where they like zap off your fingerprints so you don't have any anymore. But yeah, you could have, you know, or maybe another way to think about it is your attributes could change, right? Like facial ID, what about you're wearing glasses or sunglasses? Or like, different things on your face. What if you grow a beard? Does your facial ID work? Um, those are all different aspects. Yeah? Ooh, interesting. We'll talk about that maybe in a second. But um, yeah, OK, so, so yeah, so that data needs to be stored somewhere, right? And presumably, or maybe depending on how you do it, Maybe that's enough for somebody to recreate like your face or your thumbprint. So for instance, um, actually it's probably facial recognition. So the other question is how good are these systems, right? So for facial recognition systems, the early ones uh, that were on laptops and phones, you could just print out a picture of the person's face and then hold it up to the screen and it would unlock. So, okay, so picture, so then how do you solve that problem? That you need a picture. Yeah. Yeah, that's expensive though. That requires new devices, new hardware. Yeah. I require you to blink? Yeah, maybe you require eye movement or blink, right? So we know as we're looking at a thing, we know the image would have ever moved the eyes, and we can do eye recognition pretty good. Uh, but I know a person would. So they upgraded their systems to do, they call it this liveness detection to try to determine that the thing they're looking at in the face is alive. Um, and so they rolled this out, said, great, it beats the pictures. And now what did people do? They printed out pictures, cut out the eyes, and put little black things behind it and moved them. And the, it works, and it unlocks phones. <laughs> Um, so then they had to do things like depth. So that's when uh, things like the, um, the Kinect sensor was kind of the early one, but I know the iPhone has it, probably some Android devices too, can sense depth. So they build kind of a 3D rec uh, recreation of your face. Um, but those can still be beat by uh, masks. You can 3D print a mask of somebody's face and use that because that has depth. Ah, interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, it's You could get around that depending on the system. So you could have like a secure boot thing that figures out that no hardware has been tampered with. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting uh, attack vector. Um, other things with thumb thumbprints. So, what they, so you can get somebody's thumbprint and you can 3D print a thumb, like a clay thumb based off of that, and use that. I mean, it's not made of clay or whatever, but plastic thumb, that would work. So for a liveness test there, they try to detect uh, like your your heart like your heartbeat or whatever on there, like through the sensor to detect that your thumb is actually really there. Um, but yeah, so um, let's see, privacy. Okay, remind me of the privacy thing later about faces and stuff. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, okay, great. This is a good uh, way of thinking about these different types of authentication mechanisms. Hey, we got the whole recording this time. But still, no. Nope.